Are you guilty of something? How often do you feel guilt in your life? This video aims to be a comparative study of the concept of guilt in Fyodor Dostoevsky's Crime and Punishment and Franz Kafka's The Trial. The two books are very similar in the sense that they're both centered around a protagonist who is haunted by a crime, although one knows the details of his crime whilst the other does not. It is this contrast which is particularly interesting. In fact, the two books' contrasting depictions of guilt reveal something about the differences between the 19th century man and the 20th century man. And of course, this revelation is very much deeply rooted in each author's understandings of the psyche of their centuries. The key difference I would summarise now is that the traditional 19th century conception of guilt is rooted in a highly religious culture and as a consequence it makes guilt a matter of personal conscience. It is something within the person and not the external world, in other words the legal system, which determines whether someone is guilty. This is precisely the conclusion that Raskolnikov learns to accept at the end of the story. On the other hand, the 20th century man represented by Joseph K seeks to externalize and objectify all matters of guilt. He believes that you cannot be guilty unless the legal system says that you are so. Hence, he denies the possibility of guilt as something being internal. So in this video, I will first start by exploring the notion of guilt in Crime and Punishment before moving on to examine how this notion has shifted as we turn to the mind of the 20th century man. To understand Dostoevsky's vision of guilt, we must first pick up various hints of his worldview that are scattered throughout the book. Anyone familiar with Dostoevsky would know that he is a very religious man, and his books precisely embody such attitude. For example, the saintly figure of Crime and Punishment, Sonia, is depicted as a very religious person. And Raskolnikov also finds his ultimate sense of redemption and rejuvenation by submitting to religion. Given such context, it's very easy to conjure a preliminary sketch of Dostoevsky's view of guilt. Christianity dictates that man is born guilty because of the original sin, and only God can act as the ultimate forgiver of his sins. This is why he must repent his sins to God. It is this internal element, this personal relationship between man and God, that makes guilt such a personal and internal matter in Dostoevsky. Jim Bridges writes, Dostoevsky opposes himself to legal or ethical concepts of guilt which depend for their sanctions and judgments upon a particularization of crimes and the correlation of judgment with this particularization. In other words, because all humans are born with original sin, all humans are guilty, they're not guilty of any particular thing, but simply guilty as a state that accompanies the very nature of their existence. This idea is also most powerfully shown through an episode where a man named Nikolai confesses to a murder that he did not commit. And this is because Nikolai did bear feelings of guilt. These feelings of guilt made him incomprehensible to himself and made his life valueless and meaningless. In order to provide an explanation, to restore meaning to his life, to make his guilt concrete, he confesses to a murder. Murder is precisely a definable crime. The guilt for a murder can be dealt with and understood. Suffering under the weight of a guilt imposed for a concrete crime would be easier to bear than the suffering of a guilt whose origin is unknown. By contrast, Raskolnikov lies at the other end of the spectrum. He not only rejects the notion of original sin as a human, but furthermore he rejects to accept guilt for his actual crime. And in order to do so, he must seek assistance from logical reasoning. In Dostoevsky's works, we see repeated mentions of a contemporary trend in Western Europe, and in particular in England, which focuses on the ideas such as utilitarianism, economic progress, scientific progress, rationalism, and etc. All these are directed towards the elimination of emotion and religious feeling of humanity being some sort of all-connected whole. These sentiments were seen as backwards and irrational. A calculated, rational model of human progress is preferred. For example, Pyotr Petrovich says, Science now tells us, love yourself before all men, for everything in the world rests on self-interest. You love yourself and manage your own affairs properly and your coat remains whole. Economic truth adds that the better private affairs are organised in society, the more whole codes, so to say, the firmer are its foundations and the better is the common welfare organised too. Therefore, in acquiring wealth solely and exclusively for myself, I am acquiring, so to speak, for all, and helping to bring to pass my neighbours getting a little more than a torn coat, and that not from private personal liberality, but as a consequence of the general advance. And Mr. Lebeziatnikov, who keeps up with modern ideas, explained the other day that compassion is forbidden nowadays by science itself, 
and that that's what is done now in England, where there is political economy. Dostoevsky is in fact personally opposed to these ideas, as anyone familiar with him would know. He explicitly conveys such critique via Razumihin, a friend of Raskolnikov who is characterized as a morally exemplary person. They don't recognize that humanity, developing by a historical living process, will become at last a normal society, but they believe that a social system that has come out of some mathematical brain is going to organize all humanity at once and make it just and sinless in an instant, quicker than any living process. That's why they instinctively dislike history, nothing but ugliness and stupidity in it, and they explain it all as stupidity. That's why they so dislike the living process of life. They don't want a living soul. The living soul demands life, the soul won't obey the rules of mechanics, the soul is an object of suspicion, the soul is retrograde. However, Dostoevsky also attacks this sort of theory from another direction, that is, via the failure of Raskolnikov's moral theory of the Napoleonic extraordinary man, which he has utilized to combat the most innately human impulses in himself, namely that of guilt and the sense of universal, authentic connection with humanity provided by religion. Here is a brief overview of his theory which Raskolnikov has published in an academic journal. In his article, all men are divided into ordinary and extraordinary. Ordinary men have to live in submission, have no right to transgress the law because, don't you see, they're ordinary. But extraordinary men have a right to commit any crime and to transgress the law in any way just because they're extraordinary. I don't contend that extraordinary people are always bound to commit breaches of morals. I simply hinted that an extraordinary man has the right, that is not an official right but an inner right, to decide in his own conscience to overstep certain obstacles, and only in case it is essential for the practical fulfillment of his idea, sometimes perhaps of benefit to the whole of humanity. He attempts to use this theory to justify the murders of Eleonora and Lizaveta. For example, in an outbreak to his sister Donia, he says, Crime? What crime? that I killed a vile noxious insect, an old pawnbroker woman, of use to no one. Killing her was atonement for forty sins. She was sucking the life out of four people. Was that a crime? I am not thinking of it, and I am not thinking of expiating it. And why are you all rubbing it in on all sides? A crime. Notice how his entire reasoning is framed very much in utilitarian terms. The extraordinary man has the ability and perhaps even the responsibility or duty to transgress current morals and laws in order to advance the general well-being of mankind. He is justified in killing two women because they're not advancing the general well-being of mankind. His underlying assumption is kind of like there is this set of rationally calculated principles which can enhance the good of mankind over Overall, and the extraordinary man which he tries to identify himself with is the sole class of people who can access these rational principles and hence have the right and ability to execute them. Hence there is no need to feel any sort of kinship with the so-called ordinary people, nor any need to feel guilty for violating the law and morality that are reserved for the ordinary people. However, despite his repeated attempts to alleviate his conscience via such reasoning, his guilt still catches up to him. The sense of guilt which pervades Raskolnikov's subconscious affects him in several ways through its attempt to become conscious. It reveals itself in the compulsion to confess, to make itself known, it imprisons Raskolnikov in isolation, it severs him from his fellow human beings, it makes him incomprehensible to himself. He cannot understand either his actions or his motives. Guilt reveals itself to Raskolnikov in disturbing and traumatic dreams. Its compulsions nearly drive him out of his mind. The rational man Raskolnikov suddenly acts irrationally and insanely. It is in the sphere of immediate sensation that Dostoevsky will show the reality of guilt. It cannot be effectively interpreted as intellectual understanding. It cannot be grasped as a simple thought extraneous to the being of man. It is shown rather in man's being and action as a determination of that man. Dostoevsky uses Raskolnikov's torment to make two crucial points. Firstly, that man cannot simply reason away sensibilities which define his humanity. Secondly, through Raskolnikov's painful isolation as he runs away from guilt, we are led to understand guilt as something that binds together all humanity, because guilt only arises when we have a common compass of what's right and wrong, and a recognition of our duties and bonds to each other as fellow humans. Again, I would say this idea bears strongly religious connotations. 
So in the case of Raskolnikov, by enclosing life completely within his theory, he cuts himself off from God, society, the church and the world. But he recognises this and from this recognition proceeds to a religious and moral conversion to resurrection, life returns to him. In the epilogue, as he enters exile into Siberia, he has undergone two changes. Firstly, he has accepted his moral guilt. And secondly, he's accepting Sonia's affections and physical accompaniment of him. As a result, everything, even his crime, his sentence and imprisonment seemed to him now in the first rush of feeling an external strange fact with which he had no concern. But he could not think for long together of anything that evening. He could not have analysed anything so consciously. He was simply feeling. Life has stepped into the place of theory and something quite different would work itself out in his mind. The fundamental conclusion of the book can be summarised as such. Man is an ethical creature and cannot cease to be one. Dostoevsky points out forcefully and painfully that crime does not indicate any natural amorality, but on the contrary, testifies negatively to the fact that in turning his back on the good, man loses something without which he cannot live. Here is the core of what I wish to say about Dostoevsky's conception of guilt. And you might think it's nothing very unheard of or groundbreaking, it's a very standard analysis of his book. However, what I wish to highlight in this video now is how the 20th century man's conception of guilt, as represented by Kafka, has drifted so far away from the 19th century vision, and more likely than not, it is interpreted as a change for the worse. What does guilt mean then for the 20th century man? I would say it is something the 20th century man seeks to abandon, to escape from. What Joseph K does is precisely what Dostoevsky condemns Raskolnikov for doing, to relegate his guilt to an external judge and thereby abandon one's inner conscience. Raskolnikov tries and fails to convince himself that he is not guilty as long as the police does not catch him. Similarly, K sincerely believes that he is not guilty, so long as the court fails to convict him of a crime. However, the difference lies in the fact that Raskolnikov has in fact committed a crime and is aware of it, but only trying to delude himself. Whereas on the other hand, K seems sincerely oblivious as to the reason of his arrest. This difference is significant because it marks the change in psyche as we move into the 20th century. This allegory between K and the 20th century man's conception of guilt is quite obvious, when we step back to consider the overall vision that Kafka tends to paint in his works. And this is also what we now know as the Kafkaesque. The Kafkaesque world is characterised by nightmarish settings in which characters are crushed by nonsensical, blind authority, where the individual feels powerless to understand or control what is happening. Notice how this vision of the world sees the individual as solitarily pitted against a complex inhuman and impersonal authority. This authority is so all-consuming that it essentially dictates all matters and beliefs in the individual's life. A typical example can be shown in the Metamorphosis, which I've discussed in another video and that's linked here. Hence, Kafka sees the 20th century man as incapable of having an individual sense of moral compass, an individualistic moral conscience that is completely independent of what his society's institutions believe or enforce. This is why he cannot know whether he's guilty or not as a moral person without the verdict of law. And that is precisely why Joseph K cannot fathom what he is guilty of. So why is the 20th century man like this? I would say that the loss of religious faith plays a crucial factor. In the past, moral standards are very much associated with the teachings of religion. So when one turns away from religion, it is often equated with a simultaneous abandonment of morality. Because, well, if you don't believe in God anymore, who is to uphold the standard of judging whether you have a guilty conscience? So as Nietzsche says, God is dead. Well, after the death of God, what sort of value systems are we driven by? Answers usually include the values of capitalism, aka the economic motive, the values of the state, aka nationalism, and perhaps even values of bureaucracy, of conformity to society overall, i.e. the impersonal authority. Now, I shall illustrate how the situation that I've discussed above plays out in Joseph K. Firstly, we must consider what sort of person K is. And I believe that this is very well summarised by Christopher Conti. He is the arrogant banker who puts work before all else, browbeats his landlady, sexually harasses a fellow lodger, neglects his ailing mother and impressionable niece, and breathes not a single second's hesitation at the propriety of his conduct. 
In other words, we can see that he is kind of morally guilty of being just a bad person, despite the fact that he has not committed a legal crime. There are also various narratological manipulations throughout the novel that demonstrate Kay's attempts to manipulate the reader into believing his innocence. The naive identification with Joseph Kay begins at the point where we fail to detect the use of free, indirect discourse. The famous opening sentence is exemplary. Someone must have slandered Joseph K. For one morning, without having done anything wrong, he was arrested. K. must have been slandered because, in his own mind, he has never wronged anyone. Detecting Kafka's use of free indirect discourse, the mode of Flaubertian irony, restores the gap between author and hero and discloses Kay's imperviousness to self-criticism. Moreover, to make headway in his case, he had to reject the notion of any possible guilt right from the start. There was no guilt. The trial was no different than a major business deal of the sort he had often concluded advantageously for the bank. To accomplish this, no notion of any sort of guilt dared to be entertained, of course. All thought must be focused as clearly as possible on one's advantage. The strategic thinking he applies to his case that elevates him in the world of the bank is what brings the court proceedings down on his head. Hence, we see Joseph Kite as someone who cannot understand the concept of guilt on the moral sphere at all. This is why I align with Conti's interpretation that the court in the trial is not really the legal court, but a court of morality. For example, according to Richie Robertson, nobody is ever tried for simply not knowing the law. There is another kind of law which can be transgressed by sheer ignorance of it, and that is the moral law. In an adult human being, moral ignorance is itself a moral offence. Here are some further evidence that I believe supports this interpretation. For example, Lenny says, You can't put up a resistance against this court. You must admit your fault. Make your confession at the first chance you get. Until you do that, there is no possibility of getting out of their clutches, none at all. This is very characteristic of moral guilt. You cannot escape nor argue against it. You can only accept and repent. Furthermore, the painter says, A long time elapses between the ostensible acquittal and the new arrest. That is possible and I have known of such cases. But it is just as possible for the acquitted man to go straight home from the court and find officers already waiting to arrest him again. And the case begins all over again? Certainly, said the painter, the case begins all over again. But again, it is possible, just as before, to secure an ostensible acquittal. One must again apply all one's energies to the case and never give in. It is typical of moral guilt that it would come back to haunt a person at different times if it has not been fully repented for. One interesting note is that this core of morality also has certain resemblances to Christianity. In particular, you know, the ritual of confession to a priest and of atonement for one's sins through certain religious ceremonies at church. This comparison is most explicitly drawn when Kay literally goes to a church to listen to the preachings of a priest, and the priest tells him a sort of allegorical story at the gates of the law. And it is also quite significant that the priest says, I belong to the court, said the priest, so why should I make any claims upon you? The court makes no claims upon you, it receives you when you come, and it relinquishes you when you go. In other words, no one forces you to go to church to repent your sins, but they will always accept you as you come. Some other noteworthy points of similarity includes, the painter says, We must distinguish between two things, what is established by the law and what I have discovered through personal experience. In the code of the law, which I may say I have not read, it is of course laid down on the one hand that the innocent shall be acquitted, but it is not stated on the other hand that the judges are open to influence. Now, my experience is diametrically opposed to that. I have not met one case of definite acquittal, and I have met many cases of influential intervention. It is possible, of course, that in all the cases known to me, there was none in which the accused was really innocent. So the real law can be interpreted as the morality laid down by God, there is no case of definite acquittal because all men come with original sin, no one can be perfectly innocent. Successful cases of interference with the judges can be interpreted as, well, corruption in the church, really. The officials are bribed into like claiming to have absolved your guilt, even though you still remain guilty fundamentally in the religious sense and the eyes of God. It's another passage which reveals pretty much a similar idea. The court is impervious only to proof which one brings before the court, said the painter, raising one finger. But it is quite a different matter with one's effort behind the scenes, that is, in the consulting rooms, in the lobbies, or, for example, in this very studio. Once we understand the allusion to clergy corruption here, the picture in fact becomes rather interesting. Whilst Kafka seems to be advocating for the 20th century man to return to a religious moral conscience, 
He is simultaneously acknowledging that ritualistic repentance at church is futile and even perhaps hypocritical. Hence, what he fundamentally sees as a solution for man is to sincerely understand and acknowledge his guilt, the innate guilt of the human condition. This is precisely what the 20th century man fails to do because he has externalized all value judgments to social institutions. So I've put these two works side by side because they do overlap in many areas and their contrast to each other reveals a lot of interesting insights about religion and morality and social institutions. Of course, I know that some people may not agree with my interpretation of either novel, especially in the case of Kafka, because he is really so resistant of a definitive interpretation. So I'm really happy to hear any of you guys' opinions or interpretations on either one of these works and what you think about the content of guilt and its connotation in our society and the religious moral conscience. And don't forget to like and subscribe if you enjoyed this video.